Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program the chair of the Center of African American Studies at Princeton University uh, and author of the forthcoming Democracy in Black, How Race Still Governs the Soul of America. I guess that's coming out in 2015. Uh, Professor Eddie Gloud, thanks so much uh, uh, for, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to, to, to talk with you, Sam. Now we, you know, we spoke. Uh, I guess it was about a month ago or so uh, on the uh, the the fiftieth anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, and um, uh, we we talked about um, we started to talk about a lot of issues. I think that really are in play with what has happened in 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 Ferguson, and there are there have been there are so many issues uh, involved in what we've seen. Um, starting with the the shooting of, of Michael Brown, and uh, then with the the police uh, response, and frankly the uh, the political response. Um, just give me your 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 thoughts uh, up front of what of what we've seen there. Well, I mean it's been an unmitigated disaster um, on every level. Um, and I think it's important, Sam, to just make explicit what I think is underneath uh, what has happened in Ferguson and what has been happening throughout the country. And that is, uh, in the United States, contrary to our stated principles, there is uh, an operating and ongoing practice um, in which certain people's lives are valued more than others. Um, and and when I say certain people's lives, I'm being 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 a bit um, generous here. Um, it is the case that uh, if you're white, if you're rich, and if you're male, uh, your life, and if you're straight, uh, your life is valued more than than others who are not. Um, and and we see that in the way in which communities are policed, and we see that specifically in Ferguson. When you talk about what the town of uh, 21,000 people, 67% uh, are black, one out of four. Uh, who live in Ferguson live uh, below the federal federal poverty level, uh, which means that they make less than twenty three thousand less than twenty four thousand dollars a year, um, and you see that the consistent uh, uh, experience of a community that is over policed, that is constantly um, are under surveillance, uh, and don't feel a sense of protection. So there's economic vulnerability. Uh, there's a sense of being occupied by a police force uh, that doesn't represent them in terms of uh, the idea of serving and protect, protecting the community. Uh, there's a lack of representation in, 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 in city governance. Um, and so what you have is a population that is, for, for the most part, marginalized from uh, the daily operations of democratic life in this country, uh, uh, a population many of whom lack the resources to imagine uh, a good life for themselves and for their children. And so when you have uh, the tragedy of Michael Brown, uh, the, 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 the obvious murder of Michael Brown, um, no wonder we are experiencing what we're experiencing in Ferguson. I mean, it's, 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 been, it's been frustrating to me on some level to watch, you know, the, um, the, the reporting and, and the coverage of this, because on some level there's an element of, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess someone has called it conflict porn and, um, <laughs> and, and there, there, that, that's an element of it. And then there's also the sort of, um, the obsessive, uh, parsing of what will happen legally, uh, to this cop who, you know, I think by, uh, uh, the opinion of, of many people I have, I've read and talked to seem to think that, you know, very hard to, to be able to prosecute a cop in this situation uh, because mm -hmm. they have basically, uh, because of this dynamic, I guess, that exists. And, um, and, and very little talk and discussion about that aspect of just of this being an ongoing problem, that, mm -hmm. that, that what has happened with Michael Brown um, was a um, is is really sort of the tip of the iceberg in some way, just peering out of uh, the water. And there's really not been a national attempt to look below the surface. Right, right. And you know, I mean, I think um, uh, Bob Herbert has a piece now out uh, uh, in in Demos uh, where he talks about. 
uh, the theater around these sorts of events and nothing changes, nothing happens. Um, uh, he he was talking about, you know, the, the surprise that America uh, expresses, that white America expresses when um, when they're confronted with uh, what, for all intents and purposes, is the horror of, 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 of living particular kinds of lives in particular sorts of places. And he invokes Katrina. Uh, you know, oh my God! You know, Katrina literally washes up into the, in, you know, into the into the sight of 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 the broader country or the of the nation. What people are living daily, right? And we're going that can't happen in America, right? And so here we are uh, again with Ferguson, um, and people are asking the question, how can this happen in America when in fact it's happening day in and day out, right? It's happening every single day. I mean, if we were to um, go down the line. I mean, just in this month alone, uh, Sam, how many people have been killed by the police? Um, Eric Garner, Ezell Ford. I mean, we can just, Michael Brown, I mean, we can just keep going, right? And then, of course, there's Kendrick Johnson, there's Renisha McBride, there's Jonathan Farrell, there's Jordan Davis, there's Trayvon Martin, uh, there's Marlene Pinnock, who was just brutally beaten by a California Highway Patrol person. Um, so people are surprised, and then we have the the conflict porn as you so so powerfully put it then you have the entertainment uh corporate media driving this um and no one is really looking at the root causes and the root causes is that there's a congenital disease that distorts this country uh and that congenital disease is white supremacy yeah uh, I, it's i'm I, sorry go ahead no i i i the, i I wanted to actually talk about that because you know when we spoke um, uh, on the on the anniversary of the uh, of the Civil Rights Act, um, it, it was it, I, it is it is something that when, when you talk about white supremacy being a through line through our politics from really in, in, in the, the the founding of this country and mm -hmm. it, um, it 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 was a little bit revelatory for me because on some level I think. Um, I have always perceived this the this issue of race um, as being specific to uh, to non-whites, as opposed to seeing it from the perspective of it really is ultimately about providing supremacy for a very specific and you know and, and I think one could argue uh, historically uh, white male supremacy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and if you perceive it through that lens, things make a lot more sense as the way to break things down, I guess. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's hard for people to hear the phrase white supremacy and not think of people running around in, in hoods, uh, white hoods and burning crosses in yards or, you know, um, Putting, putting up Nazi, you know, SWAT stickers, SWAT stickers or, or the like. But white supremacy is really about um, the belief and the practice uh, that uh, white people ought to be valued more uh, than non-white people. Um, and so, and it's not just simply, and, and we tend to think about that as holding a racist belief when in fact it can be evidenced in the very social arrangements that organize our lives. So who has access to the best schools? Who has access to uh, inherited wealth? Who has access to the best jobs? Who has, and you know, and 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 we have to, we have to understand as well, brother Sam, is that white supremacy is not just simply the ideology of white people, right? Uh, it's 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 a practice um, that I can participate in. Um, uh, that President Obama can be the head of, you know, can 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 participate in, and so part of, you know, and, I, and in the background that's in my head is, you know, this this wonderful moment in James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, where he says, as long as we've been, I'm paraphrasing here, as long as we believe we're a white nation in the vein of Europe, we will never achieve our country, and so part of, you know, part of the challenge. Is that you know? I mean, just to really quickly, another study says that you know, you know, people believe that you know, racial equality is a zero-sum game. That as as black folk gain um, uh, uh, more access to American life, many white respondents believe that they lose right benefits uh, and resources. So when you have this view of racial equality as a zero-sum game, then we understand what the stakes are. 
right? We understand what the stakes are. And now we have this wonderful, wonderfully efficient ideological frame uh, to blame the very people who are locked out and marginalized for their own marginalization, right? Um, so, you know, let's make Michael Brown a thug. Let's make him a criminal. Uh, let's give an account of the culture of poverty that has produced uh, these people who don't warrant the kind of respect and dignity that we would accord to others. If that makes sense to you. Yes, I mean, I want to. I wanna, there, there's there's two things I want to touch on there, but this notion of white supremacy being a practice um, mm-hmm. and the it um, you know at one point I guess uh, Nelly um, had uh, spoken uh, about uh, and engaged in what what uh, one writer and I. I I cannot remember, but the the politics of respectability, right? And uh, this uh, notion, and and we have seen a lot about this, and we 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 spoke about this briefly and, and didn't get into it, but the um, the making uh, sort of poverty a pathology, uh, mm-hmm. and w- we see this practice adopted on some level, um, not just by the Paul Ryan's out there. Uh, but on some level, also by President Obama. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, talk, talk about the, the it, just it draw this out for us. This notion of it being a practice, the politics of respectability, which is sort of the mirror image of that practice of white supremacy. Right. So when we talk about white supremacy as a practice, what we're talking about is the very ways in which our social arrangements, right, orient us to one another in such a way that that the basic claim that some people are valued more than others are lived out in our choices. Now, that's kind of abstract, but let's kind of make it concrete. So there's a way in which uh, the, most states and uh, most states fund schools, right, by local neighborhoods, right? I mean, so you, we know how schools are funded, right, through property taxes. Uh, but we know that uh, uh, residential segregation, right, is thick, right, in the United States. Um, and there was a deliberate uh, effort to to undermine uh, uh, um, efforts at coming out of the 1960s uh, to really desegregate uh, housing in the United States and neighborhoods. Um, and so even though schools are funded by way of property taxes, and even though we know that residential segregation is rampant in the United States, mm-hmm. we still are comfortable with making the choice uh, that some people can go to bad schools and some people can't go to bad schools. Now, you and some people can go to good schools. And that you don't have to be Bull Connor, right, to hold that view. You can just say, I want my kid to go to the best schools, right? And holding that view, you still perpetuate, right, the inequality that is rampant in the country. Now, at the same time that those choices are being made, right, I just want my kid to go to the best school, we need to live in a safe neighborhood, which means we leave these other people living in in less than safe neighborhoods and going to bad schools, right, we can then say those people who attend those bad schools and those people who live in those bad neighborhoods live in those circumstances because of their behavior. It's not because of any choices that I'm making. I'm not deliberately racist, right? It's because their behavior is such that they don't exhibit, right, the wherewithal, the the, the individual uh, um, motivation to make themselves better. Uh, they just they just want government handouts. Um, their welfare babe, you know, welfare women and 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 mothers, right? Uh, their children are are undisciplined, and Obama will say they're feeding them Popeyes for breakfast. Uh, with no mention of the fact that they're food deserts, right? Or, or uh, they're not really performing in school with no real mention that there are 40 people in the classroom with an untrained teacher in front of them. So part of what we're saying is that when we think about white supremacy as a practice, we're not talking about people running around calling people the N-word or burning crosses. We're talking about the very way in which our society is organized, which reproduces benefits for particular people, right, and marginalizes others, right, because of just simply where they were born and the color of their skin. And then you have folks like me and folks like Obama, Brother Sam, who we can gain gain access to mainstream American life, right? And then we become the billboard for the inclusion, the inclusiveness of American life, when in fact um, um, we're as stratified and segregated as we've ever been. Does that make sense? Yes, and 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 also, I mean, just it, 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 generally speaking, for um, and, and I think you know this has been argued, you know, I think in in, in both a 
a critical and supportive way of President Obama, at least, that the that he has either as a, an individual or as the president has an inability to do anything other than to accept that practice on some mm. level. Um, you know, I uh, some time ago I, I, I spoke to uh, Randall Kennedy and, and he mm. wrote the, the persistence of the color line. And I think that was sort of his argument on some level that and, and, and in fact, I, I saw a piece as to why President Obama, when he addressed what was going on in Ferguson, was never going to please uh, you know, his supporters, I guess, or people who had uh, had anticipated more from him. Um, and it, it, I mean, I mean, break that down for for us a little bit, because, you know, the, the argument I saw, for instance, uh, by Ezra Klein was that, well, uh, the president, the White House mm. knows at this point that anything they come out and for, for actually creates more polarization. And so he right. just thought it was best for him to sit on the sidelines. Give me give me your take on that. But, you know, Sam, that's so that's so powerful in what it reveals. Right. I mean, to make that claim for Klein to make that claim or for for Randy to make that claim, we're basically saying without saying it explicitly that we're a deeply racist society. And so to the extent to which Obama or any of us speak directly, right, to racial disparity, to the fact that this police officer shot an 18 year old kid killed him, used deadly force, unarmed, right? The fact that we want to call attention to the racial dimensions, right, of, of, of the militarization of policing in this country would generate and act, activate, right, a kind of white backlash, would, would activate white fears, right? And it would polarize us even more. That's just a nice way of saying if Obama says this, it will give license to people to express racist views, so then the, the remedy to that um, is to not say anything directly about it, which, which in the end achieves what? It leaves all of it in place. That's right. So it's, it's a deadly circuit and cycle. And I've made the claim that if we continue to dance the dance of white supremacy, it will always continue to organize our lives. If I'm worried about activating the fear of, of my white interlocutor, right? And that leads me to repress, right, the, the very nature of the kind of hell that I'm catching, then I leave in place the conditions for the hell. And this is, this is what makes, this is, this is what infuriates me with Obama. He refuses to change the frame. And then the excuse, right, is that he cannot do otherwise. Right? He cannot be otherwise. And that, to me, is a fatalist position which suggests that America will always be this kind of place. Right. And it, 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 it basically says that um, you really need a white guy if anybody can raise this type of, uh, of issue. But even then, right, uh, the argument remains the same. I mean, at one point... Uh, it, it, it has to be addressed. I mean, you know, to me, one of the most sort of shocking things about the aftermath of this, I mean, there, there's two mm -hmm. things that have said. One is the idea that a police force could go into an 80 percent white neighborhood uh, or town <laughs> in the country, 70 percent, 60 percent white neighborhood even, mm -hmm. dressed like that with that type of gear and then on top of it, and for some reason, this just sort of just sticks out at me without wearing their badges and their name tags that they could do that is just it is it is easier for me to imagine we just move the entire country and live on the moon. It is just <laughs> impossible to imagine that that would stand. And the idea Absolutely. that nobody seems to and this is what is just shocking to me the idea that even that holder i mean who is theoretically the chief not theoretically he is the chief law enforcement officer in the country is mm -hmm. not saying this practice must stop right now uh is they need to identify themselves as police officers and it's not enough to be wearing body armor to do so it seems right. to me. uh and, i mean i think you're absolutely right that <laughs> i mean it's mind-blowing 
And and if people can't acknowledge that point or concede that point, they're being disingenuous. They're I, being disingenuous. And and, and, and we, it, it, go ahead, I'm sorry. Just that, well, I, I'm I'm and on some level, I'm just speaking to the sort of the the complete lack of of leadership here. I mean, how does mm-hmm. the federal government not be more proactive, at least rhetorically? I mean, really draw the lines of what has been crossed here. I, 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 you know, they're I mean. walking on eggs. I mean, they're walking on eggshells, man. And, you know, and I, I, had an, I had an interesting, a testy exchange on Twitter with Goldie Taylor uh, about this. And, um, you know, she was making the claim that we were demanding too much of Obama. And did we, uh, in terms of responding to the situation, in terms of the criticisms of the second um, um, uh, press press conference, and that did we make the same kinds of demands with regard to Sean Bell and and James Byrd and 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 uh, Abner Luima and and the like, and of course I I believe that there were demands and but these situations aren't analogous, right? The nine days of civic un- civil unrest didn't follow in some ways. In the same way, right? But but the point is, and I remember asking this question, saying, "Why is it unreasonable for black people to expect more from Obama? Why is that considered unreasonable? And why is it the, why is it the case that Obama can't speak directly, right, to what is happening in uh, Ferguson?" Michael Bell came on the heels of Eric Garner. Ezel Ford was murdered in L.A., right? The young man in an open, care, open and carry state in Walmart was shot down all within the matter of one month. And we have no mention of the nature of policing. Right, no mention of the nature of policing vis-a-vis this particular community directly, right? And at that point, you know, you just kind of say, okay, this is, this is not only a double standard, um, this is where we are. This is what America is. You know, it's like what my great-grandmother used to say to me. When people show you who they are, believe them. Right. I mean, I, you know, I, I saw an interview uh, that, um, uh, and, and I, I don't know if it, was, if it was Don Lemon or Jake Tapper, or somebody on CNN, mm-hmm. was interviewing a woman who, had claimed that she had had a run-in with Wilson uh, a month prior to Michael Brown yeah. being shot. Where, I saw that interview, yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I guess she was pepper sprayed, and mm-hmm. uh, he refused. He didn't. There was no. She was not charged. She was not arrested. She was, there was nothing happened. But he just refused to allow anyone around her to pour milk in her eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and and there was confusion by whoever it was that was interviewing. Like, oh, did this happen during? These protests. And she's like, no, no, this happened a month ago. And, and right. that to me is also the story that's not being told for every uh, a, 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 a black man who is being killed by police, uh, an unarmed black man who's being killed by police. How many literally hundreds, if not thousands? And, you know, when we look at stop and frisk in New York City, I mean, how many thousands of tens of thousands of times are um, are are black people being subjected to just some form of police abuse and what that does to just your perception being in society, knowing that the 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 one group that is literally specifically supposed to protect and serve you is doing exactly the opposite right i mean just look at ferguson as a case study i mean you in 2003 there were 24,532 arrest war- warrants issued to black people i mean <laughs> that's three per household 86 percent of the stops by cops in the town of black folk Right. When we, so when we begin to drill down in the data, you're talking about a community that's over-policed, a community that's constantly under surveillance, right? And so, I mean, even with the Eric Garner case, I mean, when we look at the video footage, what do we see? Officer, every time I see you, you're harassing me about selling cigarettes. Right. And it's like every time I see you, you're harassing me. I'm just not going to – and it's like, as if he was saying, I just can't take it anymore. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'm not selling cigarettes. This is what he's saying. And the next thing you know, he's in a chokehold that kills him. Right? And so there's a sense in which we're, as a nation, we're comfortable with a certain form of policing 
right, that infringes upon the liberties of a particular segment of the, of the population, right? You know, elsewhere in the country, people have, the notion of liberty has supplanted the idea of justice. People are more committed to liberty than they are to justice. But in this instance, they're not. They're saying it's okay to police in this way. It's okay to, in, 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 to, to, to presume guilt as opposed to innocence vis-a-vis -vis certain people with certain bodies who live in certain communities, right? Uh, it's okay to infringe upon their freedom. And it's happening day in and day out. And then on top of that, I'm sorry, I'm getting kind of emotional no. about it. On top of that, you, can you imagine a police officer... Uh, and I, I, would, I, I grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a household in which I was told how to behave with the police uh, for my life. It was, it was a life lesson, right, because you get killed. This is what my dad told me. And could you imagine as you try to engage respectfully with a police officer that the way in which he or she talks to you is demeaning, is degrading, doesn't accord you dignity, is cussing at you, roughing you up? Right, and then there's the you could have not done anything. There's the threat of arrest, right? And then they'll just lock you up and just put you there, and then release you with no charge, right? So this is daily, and then we, then people are shocked when people are just I've had enough. Leave me alone. Why are there risk of resisting arrest? Why don't they respect authority, right? I mean, come on, man. At some point, damn. And 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 uh, at the very least, I mean, I think the w the reason I think we have seen such persistence by the protesters in Ferguson is because this has been one of it seems to me. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I've seen suggestions that you know what 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 the the people of uh, Ferguson should be doing is organizing and voting for a recall of of their city <laughs> officials and 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 this idea that. That people could be subjected to this type of, you know, where they are are literally being stared down by a, you know, a, 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 there's no other way to really describe it, but this sort of paramilitary force. And that really mm -hmm. what they've got to do is orient themselves more towards the election box. I mean, is the, I mean, I think this this opportunity for the people of Ferguson to at least have one mode of expression. And, right. it, it, you know, it's almost like created this this zone, at least, where they they're having one opportunity to be heard, uh, uh, at least to some degree. Uh, I imagine must I, I imagine must be somewhat cathartic. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, it, to just uh, literally to have this opportunity. I mean, there's been you know, there's been some good uh, reporting on the ground where people have had the opportunity to sort of express what's going on there. It just seems that no one hears that beyond a certain sphere that uh, it, it gets sort of mediated. And by the time we hear the president talk about it, it really comes down to just sort of let's let the process work. Well, it's quite clear the process is not working. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, what's beautiful about it is that there are organizers on the ground, local organizers on the ground, uh, who are mapping out a strategy, um, who are mapping out a plan uh, to pursue uh, and to address the more structural concerns that, un that undergird um, uh, this, 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 this amazingly powerful uh, moment. Um, and I, should say this, I should say just as an aside, I think this is Obama's Katrina, and I think Ferguson will be as important uh, for this generation and their political sensibility as Obama's election in 2008 in terms of shifting, waking up, moving, waking up from this sleepwalk, that this sleepwalking that was induced in 2008. Um, but I think what on the ground there is, there is, there are, there are efforts. Um, um, I see them, I talk with folk uh, on a regular basis. There are efforts to, to really imagine a new kind of politics that's not beholden to uh, the old black liberal consensus narrative, right? I mean, we've heard of Jesse. We heard about Jesse Jackson being booed. Al Sharpton has been booed, right? We see that traditional constituency out there looking towards the ballot box, saying only 12% of black folk turned out to vote in the last election. This is, you know, then they get castigated with no analysis, right, of what this alienation from the political process might suggest, other than just simply black folk being lazy. Uh, politically. Um, and so I think uh, you hit the nail right on the head. This is a form 
of political expression uh, that's messy. Democracy is messy. Um, it challenges our, our, uh, a certain kind of commitment to law and order. Um, but it's also challenging, right, certain set of arrangements that I think run counter de to democratic life. So it has amazing political potential. Um, and we need to think about what happened post the riots in Watts in 65, right, the kinds of policies that followed. Um, um, uh, there was uh, a kind of increase in the quality of black life in some ways. But since then, what, black wages have been stagnant, uh, the economic collapse, which is a Great Depression in the black community since 2008. Um, Ferguson is is happening in a particular moment uh, in which the crisis has come to a head uh, in black America, and the nation uh, is going to have to confront it, just plain and simple. I, I want to just, uh, you know, uh, uh, sure. towards the end of our, our, our last interview, um, we got cut off, but you were talking about the, this new uh, this new sort of reimagining uh, the politics, sort of a... Um, and, and, you, and you quoted uh, Reverend Barber uh, from the Moral Mondays movement down in mm -hmm. North Carolina is talking about a third re uh, reconstruction. And I think at that time you were talking about it, it, it as an examination of of the sort of destructive force of of of, of neoliberalism and, and capitalism to a certain degree and mm -hmm. race being a, a multiplier uh, in terms of of suffering for those who are losers in the sort of neoliberal um, uh, structure. And mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote a piece in Time saying that um, uh, Ferguson's not just about um, systemic racism, but it is about um, uh, class warfare uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that that nexus. Uh, I don't know if you read that piece, but yeah, I did. I did read the piece, and you know, I think you know, it's it's always troublesome, um, even with all the insight of the piece. It's always troublesome when there is this kind of insistence that one or the other has to be the right. principal causal driver. Of, of 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 outcomes, right? Where it has to be either class or it has to be race. What we have to see in this moment is the interpenetration of both, right? Where class and race are interacting in such a way uh, that it's producing and reproducing these sorts of outcomes that that require us to be much more subtle and 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 nuanced in our analysis. Uh, what we do know uh, is clear that race and poverty interact in such a way that exacerbates the experience of marginalization, right? What does it mean to be black and poor uh, in, a, in a neoliberal uh, context um, is, 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 is pretty um, uh, horrifying in its particulars. Um, and so what we have to do, I think, uh, Brother, Brother Sam, is really wrap our minds around the way in which neoliberalism trades in race, in producing outcomes. And what do I mean by that? That is to say, there are particular populations that are disposable populations. And neoliberalism is content with that. Um, and whether they can kind of contain them, right, in hyper-concentrated neighborhoods of poverty where resources don't circulate, or whether they will incarcerate them and make money off of them, right? Uh, by using incarcerated labor uh, to produce profits uh, for private enterprise. Um, what we see uh, very clearly is the very way in which uh, uh, what was talked about in the 80s as the black underclass, right, uh, has experienced an extraordinary descent into darkness over the last uh, uh uh, four to five to six years. In fact, it's been decades in the making, right, with the disappearance of manufacturing industry, uh, with the shrinking of government, both of which were the principal avenues to black middle class life uh, in this country. Um, so we need to have a really in-depth analysis of the way in which capital is working, the way in which capitalism has reorganized itself, in my view. But we need to also understand that race must figure in that analysis because white supremacy is still working even as capital is seeking profit. And, and Does that I make think, sense? Yeah, and I think actually uh, viewing it as white supremacy makes it much easier conceptually to understand how that works there because, I mean, ultimately, if you are the one... 
if, if you are holding the 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 I guess the the, the chalice of white supremacy, and uh, you necessarily the most effective at sort of that practice will be the the wealthiest uh, white people, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, those with the most social uh, power. And at that point. Um, things begin to fall into place as to who's going to be uh, the lowest on the totem pole, uh, not necessarily in terms of a plan, but sort of as a function of, of the way neoliberalism uh, uh, operates. If you, you have that notion in mind that it is sort of a, a, a practice of, of white supremacy, things begin to line up, you know. Uh, right, poor right. white people are there to make sure that they're a buffer between uh, uh, poor black people and, and uh, white rich people uh, on some right. level. I mean, and, you know, and the thing is that, you know, um, we, we can look at how that works just simply paying attention to the figures around the white, black-white wealth gap, right? The way in which inherited wealth is working uh, in this new econ in this in, in our economy, and the way in which uh, black folk, uh, people of color, are figured in that in, in in that in that calculus, right? I mean, one of the things we do know is that the principal form of wealth for black communities has been historically owning homes, and we do know uh, one of the um, devastating consequences of the crisis of 2008. Uh, was the racialized dimension of the housing crisis, uh, and what we saw uh, since two what we've seen since 2008, brother Sam, is that the the gains in wealth in the 90s have just simply been wiped out in black in black America, just wiped away, right? So, and it, and you have to understand that in relation to what were the principal reasons that blocked our access to wealth, and it has something to do with the fact. Uh, that white supremacy has been such a crucial ideology uh, organizing uh, uh, this country. And I want to say this, too. Just as I want to say that white supremacy is a practice, I also want to suggest that freedom is a practice. Freedom is not an end. You know, it's not just something you sing and march for and then you say, boom, we got it. No, freedom is a practice. It's, 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 it's evident in the way in which we act and in the way in which we uh, go about navigating the world. Um, and so freedom is an ongoing aim and ambition, right, in the, in, in, in the context of arrangements that in some ways seek to thwart our, our efforts, if that makes sense. And, you know, I, I just wanted to, the sure. there was a, a stat that just jumped out me in some of the reading I've been doing that, uh, and I... I think it was uh, from Brookings, uh, but it it says that uh, for a white family, every dollar of income turns into five dollars of wealth. For the typical African American family, one dollar translates into sixty nine cents of wealth. In other words, we're also seeing, particularly in the past fifteen to twenty years, that those that the rate in which that that mobility is working backwards for right. black people in this country that right. if you are born in a sort of a median income and you're white the chances of the kids out earning the parents is something like 65 percent it goes the opposite direction right. if you're black right that's that right. and that's a dramatic change from the 25 years or so or 30 years uh, following the Civil Rights Act. Uh, yeah, I mean, you hit it on the head. I mean, and, and when you have that kind of data in front of you, uh, and, we, and of course we could marshal all sorts of other data, right? Um, it, it becomes hard to not say what we've been saying over the course of our conversation today, right? Uh, that we have to confront this fundamental claim that some people are valued more than others. Some people's lives in this country are valued more than other people's lives. Some people's children's future are cherished more than other people's children's future. Right? And we have to interrogate what that means and how that does not square with our conception of ourselves as a, as, 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 as a beacon of democratic life. Right? Um, I mean, my colleagues here at Princeton, is all, they've, they've already made the headlines by saying that you know, the U.S. is no longer a democracy, it's an oligarchy. Right? Um, but but part of part of my work, um, and I think our work, Sam, uh, is to really 
understand as carefully as we can what stands in the way of achieving our country. What is what what blocks the way? And Ferguson is a wonderful example of this. What blocks the way? Right? It's our refusal. It's it's the nation's refusal to accord dignity and standing to all of its citizens, to all of its people. Uh, and there are reasons why that's the case, because people can get rich off of having disposable populations in their midst. Right? But I think I think we have to just, I mean, the data you just laid out and there, the other data, and people will dismiss it. And when they dismiss it, you just kind of say, okay, how, how, how can I say that beyond saying this is disingenuous, how can I say that I can't have the conversation that we need to have with you because you're stuck in this thing? You're just denying the reality of the, of the matter. Um, but it's hard. Right. Well, Professor Eddie Gloud, uh, Chair of the Center of African American Studies at uh, Princeton University and author of the forthcoming, I Can't Wait, uh, Democracy in Black, How Race Still Governs the Soul of America. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, genuinely appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. You have a great one. You too.